Recently, the Trump administration proposed defining gender as an individual's assigned sex at birth. But the medical community, including this week's guest, tells us gender is not so simply expressed. He's Dr. Jason Rafferty this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, filmmakers, authors, journalists, and more, to make sense of the big stories that shape public life in the United States today. This week, we're joined by Dr. Jason Rafferty, a child psychiatrist at Bradley Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, who is the author of a new policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics about care and support for transgender and gender-diverse young people. Jason, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you work, as we mentioned, at Bradley Hospital, at Hasbro Children's Hospital, at Brown University School of Medicine. Uh, tell us about your work and sort of what drew you to medicine in the first place. Oh gosh, I've wanted to be a uh, pediatrician from a very young age, actually since about eighth grade, uh, when I did a math project with my own pediatrician and learned more about what he does as a job. Um, and over the years, I've just become more and more drawn to working with children, working with families, and then through medical school, more, more and more so towards working with adolescents. And you're both a child psychiatrist and a pediatrician. Yep. Is yep. that an unusual combination? It is. Um, I actually went through a training program called the Triple Board. Um, which is a combination of pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child psychiatry really combined to allow for intense training in sort of, develop, in sort of child development um, and also just in terms of, uh, you know, sort of developmental issues across the lifespan. Um, there's only a few programs across the country, but for me, it really just uh, created a lot of avenues to explore my interests in adolescent medicine and um, and also in development. From a clinical perspective, in yeah. sort of caring for your patients, what's the advantage that gives you? So I work with a, you know, a, a somewhat um, complex sort of patient population. They, there's a lot of needs that sort of are coming together, whether it be with the gender diverse youth or, or um, you know, substance abusing youth or youth who face a lot of hardships with you know, socioeconomic status, housing and things like that. And the real nice thing is that when patients come to see me, I can really navigate a lot of different systems to create access to resources, but I can also offer access to reproductive care and the same appointment I might offer psychotherapy or med management, really taking care of an understanding and taking care of the whole child and the whole family. So a, a lot of your work is with transgender and gender diver, diverse people. Yeah. So before we get into that discussion, give us a little bit of, of, of help here with definitions. Mm -hmm. you know, because transgender means one thing, gender diverse another, and there are many other categories yeah. or descriptions that we could use, but just so, give us sort of an overview. Yeah, some of the common definitions that are out there is, um, you know, we look at sex versus gender, sex being sort of a label that's assigned to people at birth, basically, or even before birth, actually, from the first mm. ultrasound, often there's a, you know, label of boy versus girl, or maybe we need to run some more tests, uh, and it starts people on a, um, on sort of a trajectory of, of um, of parental aspirations and society stereotypes around the life that you may, you know, you may live. And a lot of childhood is marked by these um, sort of stereotypes and, and whatnot. That is compared to gender and gender identity, which is the inner sense of who you feel you are. And for most people, the two actually line up. Um, you were identified at birth as male and maybe, you know, as you're going through adolescence, that continues to be the label that you feel fit. And for that, we use the term cisgender. For, uh, you know, for people who took chemistry, um, you know, a, a cis molecule is one where you have different groups coming off the same side. So the idea being the two labels are congruent or <laughs> on the same side. And for, you know, for the population in which that doesn't fit, um, their identity differs, that's where we start to look at this umbrella of gender diversity, which is a very, very broad you know, sort of um, uh, a label that people may take on. 
Gender diversity includes a lot of different things. It can include kids um, and people who are gender fluid, meaning in some situations they may feel, may feel more feminine, in other situations they may feel more masculine or something else. It can include um, you know, people who may feel very different in terms of the label they took on at birth. So they may have been labeled male at birth. Now, they're take, now they feel much more female um, in terms of what they're recognizing as their internal um, identity. And so as these sort of, this exploration occurs, um, usually it's during childhood and adolescence, um, over time, these, you begin to understand yourself better and better, and as your sense of identity becomes more persistent, consistent, and insistent, that's where people start to take on the label of transgender. Um, transgender, again, going back to chemistry, is when the groups are coming off two different sides of the molecule, and the idea being that there's some sort of either transition, or now we call it a gender affirmation process, because we're affirming who people are inside. Um, so transgender, in some sense, is a smaller umbrella, where uh, that includes usually um, includes sort of people who carry on a label different than they they had at birth in a more sort of persistent persistent manner. So uh, just uh, so when we're talking about gender diversity or yeah. someone who's gender diverse, is this it's, it's it's fundamentally about moving away from the binary? <laughs> oh, definitely. And even beyond that, um, you know, in sort of uh, in sort of the 1990s, 2000s, there's a lot of focus on spectrums. Um, and this idea, not just of having sort of male versus female, but this sort of blending that we're all in the spectrum between male and female. Today, it's even, we even recognize that gender is probably even more diverse. Like I mentioned, there's maybe fluidity. Um, there's many aspects of ourself that we don't necessarily associate with our gender, certain interests and things like that, that isn't necessarily, you know, fit into a male or female, you know, stereotype. So I think we look at this now as much more complex than even a spectrum. Um, in sort of a three-dimensional, more dynamic sort of way, and that's where the gender diversity comes in. Um, and I, I will say, a lot of this is new. These labels, these terms <clears throat> are very, uh, you know, they're complicated. A lot of my patients, with the label that they choose to use, they choose it for very personal reasons. And so even as a doctor, my first approach is always to ask patients to sort of define whatever labels they want to use, that I'm using the labels in the manner, you know, in which is most affirming for them. And it allows me to learn, too. It's kind of a humbling experience. So obviously it's the right of an individual to identify as something. Yeah. I mean, that, we, that's like a fundamental. We start with that. So the, so the young people and families who come to you at Bradley and Hasbro Children's, mm -hmm. what are they looking for? Why are they coming to you? Usually it's, um, you know, it's changed a lot, I will say. I've been, I've been at um, Bradley Hospital for about seven years. When I first came to Bradley Hospital, it was a lot of... Um, a lot of more at-risk um, later teens uh, who were sort of breaking away from their family, maybe off on their own for the first time in college, and really worried about abandonment and rejection. And we would st sort of step in, and it was really a lot of like safety assessment. Can we get you housing? Can we, you know, do you have a food source? Do you, all of those sort of basic necessities. Right. That was about, you know, like I said, about seven, seven years ago or so. Today, it's very different. We're seeing a lot of younger kids coming in with their families, coming in with questions, questions about labels, questions about you know, behaviors that parents may be sort of wondering or concerned about. Um, and they're coming to us basically looking for education and guidance earlier on, which is like literally sort of turning the whole model on itself because now it's all about providing support and assuring that the family is really sort of together and working through this as a unit rather than just the child. What accounts for that change? I think a lot of the increased sort of social awareness and social acceptance that we've had with uh, particularly the LGBTQ <clears throat> community, um, and I think, you know, especially with, with parents now, I think it's just increased awareness around um, needing to sort of support kids and, you know, through sort of gender development. So stigma, though, and, and discrimination remain issues mm -hmm. for individuals. Is that correct? Can you talk, oh, a, little definitely. Bit, and talk I, a little I, bit about that, where that discrimination is, yeah. where the prejudice is felt? Yeah. And also, as sort of as a third component here, I'm guessing it varies by your community where you live, I think. Oh, definitely, yeah. So talk yeah. about all that. I mean, I think, it, you know, it, there's definitely a lot of variation even within the United States in terms of different areas. Um, even within, you know, living here in Rhode Island, um, you know, we're seen as relatively accepting, but we, I still have kids that come to me, um, you know, saying that something may have happened that they viewed as discriminatory or whatnot. 
oftentimes a lot of the discrimination I, I, I personally believe comes down to a lack of understanding and appreciation for what that person is going through. You know, these stereotypes, these binary stereotypes of male versus female are just ingrained in us from a young age. And when um, you know, we encounter people who sort of challenge those, it can be very uncomfortable. And I think that's where a lot of the misunderstanding sort of mm -hmm. comes from. Um, but I will say that even, you know, a lot of what I see is, is revolves around school. That's where kids spend a lot of their time. And a lot of it has to do with school districts who are well-intentioned, but may not, you know, may lack the education to really understand how to meet these kids' needs. And more and more school districts are reaching out to us. They're involving families in a lot of decisions that they're making. But you think about it, you know, schools are a very sort of gendered place. There are male and female bathrooms. Bathrooms are often shared. Um, you know, sports teams may be divided by gender and, you know, it, it, sexual education and things like that. Um, and it can make it very difficult for a kid who is struggling with their identity and understanding who they are to navigate that system. Can't peers also be an issue in terms of bullying, in terms of shaming, or whatever yeah. the term would be? I mean, it's not just the, the structure, the, the yeah. school and, and the athletics, and it's yeah. kids... Oh yeah, Bull age. bullying is a big issue as well. And again, I think it comes down to um, you know based on the lack of understanding. But a lot of bullying too is sort of picking out people who are different from us, right? Uh, the out groups per se. And I think that's where um, a lot of this comes down to that you know um, people who struggle with gender and are able to sort of open up about that are really taking on a risk of ending up in, a, in sort of the out group and bringing on a lot of sort of targeting when it, especially when it comes to to bullying and um, peer relationships I think the other thing too is just community education a lot of the bullying that I've um, you know that I've encountered through my patients really is I think comes to, sort of down from a lot of lack of understanding on the level of parents and the level of you know maybe school administrators and whatnot coming down to kids generally young kids tend to be very curious and understanding um, from a young age uh, towards their peers but then as they start to grow and developmentally start to recognize differences they they really sort of open to a lot of the stereotypes and a lot of the criticisms that um, you know the society sort of holds and then they absorb those in it you know, manifests itself through bullying and, and things like that. And, and, and this can have, you know, serious mental health consequences. Yeah. A study cited by the American Academy of Pediatrics found that more than 50% of youth identifying as transgender had suicidal thoughts. Yeah. And that 31% reported a previous suicide attempt. I mean, that's a crisis. Yeah. That, that's yeah. a public yeah. health and mental health crisis. Yeah. So what we really advocate for in the, uh, in the paper is the sort of the gender affirmative model of care and the idea behind that is really when when patients come in to see me <clears throat> or in sort of any setting is really appreciating the the child and the family for where they are at emotionally at that moment um, you know allowing creating a safe space for the child to open up with some of their concerns and questions and hesitations and whatnot and I think that that um, you know I think that that really sort of helps in terms of um, you know being able to sort of create an environment of acceptance. And it's through our modeling that hopefully, you know, as we advocate for in the paper, it's through our modeling that we hope to, you know, allow schools and whatnot to come in and understand and celebrate gender diversity as much as any other form of diversity. The paper you're talking about is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, yep. ensuring comprehensive care and support for transgender and gender diverse children and adolescents. Um, what prompted the Academy to, to, to issue this policy paper now? So it was, um, it actually, we were looking at every few, every five years or so. The academy looks at um, at the papers that are, we have and the positions that we have. And for a long time, there was a paper on uh, basically looking at the health needs of all LGBTQ youth, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning. And it just that's a very large umbrella, and it includes a, really sort of a wide range of um, of health needs. And what we found in the in the, in the <coughs> previous positions were that it didn't get at some of these specific questions that we're talking about now that kids who are gender diverse face um, and the ways that primary care you know, pediatricians could really um, become involved in the process of supporting these kids, what they could do, ways they could counsel families and educate families. And so it, you know, out of that, we, we decided that we were gonna sort of tease apart a specific paper dealing with these challenges. Um, 
And that's, yeah, that's sort of where it came from. And then also, like I said, sort of the increased r social recognition. You know, I think especially over the last, you know, three to five years, um, with more people sort of coming out publicly, whether it be celebrities or people in the media, you know, things like that, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of misunderstanding around people who are gender diverse and some of the challenges that they face. So both of those things were sort of coming together at the same time, and, uh, and the paper was the product. So you wrote the paper, is that yep. correct? Yeah. You had a lot of people who worked with you or you reviewed a lot of work. Talk about the process coming to this paper, which is 15 yeah. pages long, was <laughs> just recently published. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it, I, you know, I was the one who drafted the original draft and then it goes out through multiple rounds of review through various committees within the American Academy of Pediatrics. So there's a committee on adolescent health, there's a committee on LGBTQ health and things like that. And so, you know, you're really talking about some of the, the experts in the field who, who work from various angles with um, families who have gender diverse youth really weighing in on some of the, um, you know, some of the content. And through this process, you end up with a product that's, you know, really been vetted and um, really sort of stands for, you know, becomes sort of the, the position of the academy. You know, it's not my personal position. It really is adapted because of the number of people that really weigh in on it and provide comment. Um, and then it moves on to the, uh, you know, to publication and becomes part of the academy. So the, the policy tells healthcare professionals, and I'm quoting here, that a strong, non-judgmental partnership with youth and their families can facilitate exploration of complicated emotions and gender diverse expressions yeah. while allowing questions and concerns to be raised in a supportive environment. What does that mean in practice? <laughs> so the idea behind this is, um, you know, some of our previous assumptions around a binary, um, there's a, there was a previous assumption that um, in and of itself, being gender diverse was a form of mental illness. You know, and so this is sort of moving beyond that to sort of say gender development is a normal part of development we all go through. We all experience gender. And for some kids and some individuals, it's more complex. Um, it's not necessarily the label that we give them. Their own internal identity, um, you know, is, is maybe different. And we need to sort of work with those individuals in a supportive, safe, non-judgmental environment to really allow them to engage into a process of discovery and exploration to, you know, to, to really realize, you know, who they are on the inside. And as they go through that, there's both, sometimes there's a lot of motivation, a lot of pride and joy. Sometimes there's a lot of questions, hesitation, um, you know, and, and we need to work through all the emotions. So it really is sort of creating a model where pediatricians can sit with a child or with, you know, and the whole family. Um, and understand both the concerns as well as some of the real excitement around discovering who you are and be part of that process with them. So the, the policy states that, and I'm quoting here, gender identity evolves as an interplay of biology, development, socialization, and culture. We talked a little bit before about some changes. Yeah. This is really a new understanding. Is a relatively new understanding. Is it not of what gender even means? Yeah, because I think usually, you know, the old understanding would have been following, falling back on, on what we consider now sort of your assigned sex. Yeah. You know, there's male, female. It's determined a lot by biology or chromosomes and your, you know, anatomy. But now it, you're right. This is a much broader understanding that your own internal sense of self goes well beyond just what body parts you have. Um, and there's an emotional piece to that. Um, the definitions that we're using in terms of masculine, feminine, something else, you know, some of the, the gender diverse, things like that, these are socially constructed definitions. So some of them may be inadequate and they may be continuing to evolve. And so that this, this idea of gender tries to sort of encompass a, a, an evolving field and understanding of, uh, of identity. You know, so I don't wanna, I do not wanna sidetrack this conversation entirely, but Something you just said, so the, the Trump administration recently mm -hmm. has said that they want to define gender, quote, on a biological basis that is clear, grounded in science, objective, and administrable. Mm -hmm. Sex, gender is, mm -hmm. is this basically say gender is sex, yes. sex is gender. That's, that's, my under, that's my understanding from what's been, um, I haven't what, seen what's been published. the memo yeah. or whatnot, but yeah. what's been published, yeah. What does that, is, uh, that flies in, in, in direct contravening view of what you've done with the American Academy yeah. of Pediatrics. Yeah. What does, uh, what does uh, the politics and the policy that comes from Washington, does that have an impact on the work that you do and, 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 on, and on the patients that you see? 
definitely. I think, um, you know, we more and more, I think, over the past few years, we've seen a lot of young kids even um, coming in that hear things on the news, whether it be about this, whether it be about uh, transgender ban in the military, yeah. um, whether it be about sort of, you know, violence that happens, gender-based violence. <laughs> and they come into our clinic and it is incredibly distressing. What may seem like a, pol a political issue for many of these kids and these families is incredibly personal. Um, and it leads to some of the, you know, depression, some of the real sort of, um, you know, a lot of sort of self-questioning and, uh, and feelings of shame and guilt um, that these kids really struggle with. And that's where when you talk about sort of some of the suicide rates and things, the, the belief in the gender affirming model is that the mental that many of the mental health problems we're seeing are due to the fact that these kids are growing up a lot of times in a society that doesn't understand them. Um, and so policies like this and whatnot are uh, really placing them at risk. And over time, that develops into some of the mental health issues that we see. And, and statements like that from Washington, be it regarding the military or whatnot, are publicized. And so clearly yeah. young people, they, you know, young people read, they're on social media. This, this, yeah. So I, I clearly can yeah. see the cause and effect there. Yeah. And you have to deal with, with the damage, the, the result. Yeah. So you practice in hospitals and you do a whole lot of other things, but the policy is really aimed at pediatric primary care providers, yep. PCPs, basically. Yep. Why are they a first and critical component in all of this? Why them and not yeah. pick another well, specialty? Well, the policy itself um, is, is much is, is focused on this gender affirming model and not as much on some of the specifics around, you know, what interventions, do you use hormones, you know, things like that, that, um, you know, that's not where we're sort of guiding a lot of primary care pediatricians. What we're looking at right now is, is creating a system of gender affirmation, a safe environment to bring up these concerns. And that's something that you don't need a specialist for. That's something that can happen on the primary care level. If a, if a child is starting to feel that their identity doesn't fit them, we want, to, we want hopefully the, pri the primary care pediatrician to be able to A, have an environment where the child can sort of bring up those concerns, but also to, um, you know, to really be able to mobilize supports, uh, whether it be emotional health supports, whether it be social supports, you know, reaching out to the school with the bullying and, and things like that, to allow that child to feel safe in other environments and continue towards positive development. Um, you know, it's, it really is, everything, everything starts, I think, at the primary care office. And some of the first steps around social and emotional affirmation, um, really sort of, again, under, creating an environment to help the child and the family understand, is really, I think, what is, at times, some of the life-saving interventions. You know, um, there's good research out there saying that even, you know, one or two supportive people in a child's life can make a huge difference when it comes to anxiety, depression, and even suicidality. You know, so that pediatrician, you know, who may not be the most knowledgeable person, if, they come, if they're coming in creating a safe, non-judgmental environment, that could be profound in the life of that child. So there's an educational component for healthcare professionals, and I want to read again just a little, yeah. little snippet here from the policy. The policy asks that, and I'm quoting now, medical school residency in continue, continuing education for professionals integrate core competencies on the emotional and physical health needs and best practices for the care of youth and their families. How do you change where change is needed in, in the medical establishment to, to reach this new understanding and awareness, which ultimately yeah. can only be usually beneficial for yeah. people, families and kids? Well, I will say in general, what you know, the feedback we've gotten and you know, sort of the experience that I've had is, is that we're, ri we're riding with the tide. Um, oh. A lot of primary care pediatricians are asking for more information. They have kids coming into their practice who are asking them questions and they want to know how to respond. Um, in terms of being able to, you know, understand terms, in terms of being able to sort of create an environment and, you know, what's the first thing you say? What should you be looking out for? How do you support the family? And so there's a lot of um, people who are on the front lines, primary care, really looking for this information. And then I think the next step is, is really on the academy and on other groups to sort of create, whether it be continuing education or primary education in, in medical schools, um, I will say, you know, being at Brown, um, we have a, there's a course now related to LGBTQ health, and that actually started from the medical students. They started bringing in speakers because they wanted more training on it. And now, um, now you have a course. Now there's a course, in, yeah, oh, that's and great. It's, it's just really wonderful to see, but I think it really is coming out of people firsthand seeing this in practice and saying, I need 
need more training. This is some place we need to focus because I really want to support these kids, this family, and even you know even gender diverse adults too. People in adult so care. So a new generation of PCPs are going to get it. Yeah. What's yeah. what's the reaction to the policy, bud? By and large, it's been um, it's been positive. I think uh, people really resonate with this idea of affirmation, um, especially you know focusing on some of the social emotional. Um, aspects and this sort of first line how to have these discussions and why it's important to have these discussions at an early age and mobilizing supports I think that's a message um, you know regardless of sort of you know different sort of views on on some aspects of care that is usually a message where a lot of different perspectives can come together on there's a relative agreement that um, gender diverse families need support they need understanding and uh, and I think it really is this this model mm -hmm. is based in strength-based language, it's based in resiliency, it's based in a lot of the models that currently exist in pediatrics throughout other fields and other areas. This is great and important work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a wonderful contribution. A very quick question, what are you working on now in terms of research or is this still sort of your all-consuming passion? I do this, I do, um, you know, a lot of what we're working on now is trying to promote research in this area. Um, one of the tough parts is when we do start talking about uh, various, you know, interventions, whether it be hormones or puberty blockers or things like that. Um, you know, kids have been using these, but there's not a lot of research out there. So we're trying to promote more, better understanding of some of the, you know, uh, some of what comes from the long-term sort of use of various interventions. So we're working on that. We're trying to organize, um, you know, some of that to again get more information out to various providers. The other thing too is creating networks of support because this is an area where collaboration is just so important. Um, and being somebody who's both a psychiatrist and a pediatrician, I get it. You know, I get the importance of mental health. A lot of pediatricians feel that they're doing this on their own, and so what we're trying to really do is is really sort of pull mental health and physical health together into a collaborative system. It's important work. Jason Rafferty, thank you so much for being with us. That is all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.